and we'll be starting shortly. Good evening. Welcome to the third and final broadcast debate by the three candidates running for Congress in Illinois' 12th U.S. House District. The candidates are Green Party candidate Paula Bradshaw of Carbondale, Republican candidate Jason Plummer of O'Fallon, and Democratic candidate Bill Enyart of Belleville. The candidates will be questioned by Beth Hunsdorfer of the Belleville News Democrat, Gary Metro of the Southern Illinois Newspaper, and Jennifer Fuller of WSIU Radio. I'm Jack Titchener of WSIU Television. I'm your moderator for tonight. We will begin with a two-minute opening statement from each candidate, the order of which was determined by a drawing by the candidates before the debate. Uh, Paula Bradshaw will get the first opening statement. Thank you. I come from a family of coal miners. My great-grandfathers went into the mines at ages six and eight. That was before the days of the burdensome regulations. My grandpa went in the mines at age 12. He and his brothers helped organize for the UMW, creating a better living for miners after them, including my dad's brothers and cousins. My background gives me two unshakable positions. I know which side I'm on, and it's not the side of the mine owners. And I know that people don't go into the mines because they enjoy risking their lives and health. Given a choice between a dangerous, destructive job and unemployment, people choose the lesser of two evils, kind of like the way they vote. Southern Illinois is hurting. As a nurse, I see injured workers who don't have sick time, people released from prison who can't afford medicine, homeless people who have their few possessions seized by the police, children with cancer, and people choking with asthma. People need jobs, but it's wrong to pit citizens against each other. Open more coal mines and some will get non-union jobs, but others will get asthma and mercury poisoning. Start fracking and a few will get jobs, but our water supply is put at risk. We need good jobs, but they don't have to be at the expense of our neighbors. My plan creates living wage jobs that do not require risking your life, polluting our air, water, and soil, harming tourism, increasing earthquakes, or contributing to global warming, which threatens not just farming, but all life on this planet. Submitting to Peabody or American Coal or the fracking outfits because they promise you jobs is like inviting a pickpocket to your party because he promises to bring a six pack. We know who gets rich from this, and it isn't us. If coal mining were the way to prosperity, West Virginia would be the richest state in the nation. My Green New Deal is a plan for full employment at living wage jobs, restoring our environment. We don't need to turn Southern Illinois into a moonscape. Let's build a prosperous future together by building an infrastructure for the 21st century. <clears throat> Jason Plummer. Throughout this country right now, voters are frustrated. In the 12th Congressional District in Southern Illinois and Southwestern Illinois in the Metro East, Voters feel like their voice isn't being heard in Washington, D.C. They feel that the issues that impact their lives, for the better or for the worse, aren't being talked about in Washington. They feel the issues that are important to them aren't being answered. We need folks that are going to go to Washington, D.C. that are going to address the issues on behalf of the American people. There's a philosophical debate going on right now. You're going to see a philosophical debate on this stage. I think the debate's pretty simple. Does government make the best decisions for the American people? Or do the American people make the best decisions for themselves? Who do you want to make your health care decisions? Who do you want to make your financial decisions? Who do you want to choose the path of your family and your children as they graduate schools, as they come back from the military? We need a government that is responsive to the American people, that doesn't make the American people go a direction they don't want to go. The 12th Congressional District is tremendously blessed. We have great coal and oil and gas reserves. We've got SIU Carbondale to the south. We've got Scott Air Force Base to the north. We've got great proximity to St. Louis. We've got transportation networks, road, rail, river right-of-ways. We've got great people. We have all the assets anybody could ever ask for, but we continue to struggle. We hear about national unemployment rates. We hear about state unemployment rates. 
The unemployment rate in the 12th Congressional District is 10.5%. The unemployment rate right now, where we are in St. Clair County, 11%. If you look back and you look at the people, and you look at the resources, and you look at the opportunities, do you really believe the unemployment rate in this area should be 11%? I don't believe it should be. I think it's 11% because of bad public policy. I want to go to Washington to take a new perspective, new public policy, and put the people of Southern Illinois back to work. Mr. Inyard. Good evening. I'd like to thank Lindenwood University Belleville, WSIU, the Southern Illinoisan, and the Belleville News Democrat for sponsoring this debate. This debate is a job interview. It's your opportunity to evaluate us without the noxious attack ads paid for by out-of-state interest groups. Let me take a few minutes to tell you about me. I've lived and raised my family and paid taxes in the district for more than 40 years. I'm the son of a factory worker and spent 35 years in uniform, both active duty and National Guard, protecting our great nation and Illinois. I could never have attended college or law school without the GI Bill and student loans. I left my civilian career of 25 years to serve the last five years as the Illinois National Guard's commanding general. The News Democrat detailed all three candidates in Sunday's edition. I would urge you to go to bnd.com and read all three. There are serious policy differences among the candidates. There are serious differences in experience, in responsibility, and leadership as well. I ask you to consider them. I support tax fairness. Mr. Plummer supports more tax breaks for millionaires. Both Ms. Bradshaw and I released our tax returns. Mr. Plummer has refused for four years to release his. I have a clear, achievable jobs plan. Mr. Plummer's focuses on big business welfare and on tax breaks for millionaires. Scott Air Force Base is the largest single employer in the district and brings $3 billion a year to our economy. Who is better positioned to keep Scott Air Force Base vital? A retired two-star general or a 30-year-old who's only worked for his father? You will make the determination which of us has a better plan to make it better for working people in Southern Illinois. I ask you to consider which of the candidates has proven experience, proven leadership, proven integrity to make tough decisions. There are three Time. drastically different visions, one Time. player choice. Thank you. It's time now for questions from our panelists. Each uh, candidate will have two minutes to answer the question. And please withhold your applause until the third candidate in each round has uh, answered the question. First question comes from Beth Hunsdorfer for Paula Bradshaw. Good evening. Good evening. Scott Air Force Base is the largest employer in the Metro East with more than 13,000 civilian and military jobs generating between two and three billion dollars worth of economic activity a year. If you were elected, what would you do to protect the base from possible cuts that would hurt the area's economy? Scott Air Force Base is a base that's right here in the territory of the United States. I have never said that we don't need a strong defense in this country. What I'm against is military empire with 900 bases all over the world trying to extend American influence over people who probably don't want us there and um, trying to have control over other people's resources. I mean, I would, I, and I think it's kind of interesting that you point out how much the federal government spending helps the economy of the 12th district because my plan is all about government spending to make a more prosperous economy, but not just with the uh, military industrial complex, but with actual putting people to work, building a sustainable infrastructure so we don't have to go all over the world and try to take other people's resources. We can live within our own resources in our own country, and we can do it by taking, cutting the military budget in half, keeping Scott Air Force Base and the other Air Force and the other bases in this country here to protect us from foreign invasion, but not to go invade other people's countries. So that would be $350 billion right there if we cut our military in half, taking it back to 2,000 levels, and, and we would still be spending more than the rest of the people and the world 
our nearest competitor is China. If we cut our, mil uh, our military budget in half, we would still be spending two and a half times more than they are. So I'm, I'm like Scott Ritter, who says it's good, to ha it's good to have a defensive military, a strong military. It's like having a good fire department. You know, you want those people trained, you want them to have the best equipment, but that doesn't mean you support arson. You know, just so you, you can support the fire department without supporting arson. You can support the military without supporting invasions of other countries. Jason Plummer. <clears throat> well, you know, every month when I put on my Navy uniform, I go serve at Scott Air Force Base. I'm an intelligence officer in the Navy. My unit's at Scott Air Force Base. Um, the only person I'm working for there are the American people. I'm proud to go to Scott Air Force Base because I know the important role that, that installation serves in national security. I know it also plays a very important role in, in, in the local economy. $3 billion impacts about 10 percent of the housing units on the Illinois side of the St. Louis region. It's very important to the local economy, but it can never be overlooked. The wonderful job Scott Air Force Base and the men and women in uniform and the civilian workers at Scott do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, for our national security. We need to look at Scott not as a situation as how do we keep Scott and maintain Scott. We need to look at Scott from a situation of how do we grow Scott Air Force Base. You know, Jerry Costello, John Shemkis, and other uh, elected officials in the area have done a great job in keeping Scott Air Force Base and growing Scott Air Force Base, and we need to send someone to Washington with that same purpose. In order to get that accomplished, though, you need to send someone to Washington that's willing to stand up for what's right, that's not going to toe a party line, be it Democrat or be, Republic or be it Republican. Scott Air Force Base isn't a Republican or Democrat issue. It's a national security issue. It's an American issue. It's a Southern Illinois issue. Sequestration is a perfect example. The military right now is under the threat of drastic cuts that will drastically import Scott, impact Scott Air Force Base because our elected officials of both parties aren't willing to stand up and make the right decisions. They're not willing to put their partisan beliefs and their, their ideologies to the side for what's right for the country. If we send people to Washington right now, we need to make sure that they're going to fight for the local economy, but more importantly, they're going to fight for Scott Air Force Base. I serve there every month. I serve with people who are there, have been there for a long time. When I go to Washington, D.C., my focus isn't going to be on keeping Scott Air Force Base. It's going to be on growing Scott Air Force Base, not because of the local economy, but because the men and women there do a phenomenal job day in, day out in protecting this nation. Partisan politics isn't going to do anything for Scott Air Force Base. Leaders are going to do something for Scott Air Force Base. Thank you. Mr. Inyard. Thank you. I'll have instant credibility when I go to Congress on defense issues. I will be the only retired general officer serving in Congress if I'm elected to serve in Congress. The 126th Air Refueling Wing, that's an Illinois Air National Guard unit, a thousand folks serve in that unit. About 400, <clears throat> excuse me, about 400 of them are full time. Those folks served under my command. I've already brought units to Scott. I've already brought jobs to Scott. In fact, that Army National Guard armory that you see sitting out there, right outside the Shiloh Gate, when that, when we knew that unit was going to come to Illinois, I had the opportunity to help decide where that would be sited. I called a fellow by the name of Terry Beach, who was the Economic Development Coordinator, uh, Director for St. Clair County, and said, Terry, I need some ground. Terry said, what for? I said, for an Army National Guard unit that's going to bring over 150 part-time jobs and about 10 full-time jobs. He said, I've got five acres at Mid-America Airport that we'll make happen. And we made that happen. And we uh, developed that armory, and it was, uh, there was a grand opening of that armory about two years ago. So um, the, the next thing that we need to bring for Scott Air Force Base to that refueling unit is the KC-46A tanker. That's the new tanker that's going to be built by Boeing. Those contracts are in place, and I know that Scott Air Force Base, that the Air National Guard unit, the Illinois Air National Guard unit there, is in the lead to be the first National Guard unit to receive that plane, and I have the credibility and the knowledge to make sure that that happens. Thank you. The next question comes from Gary Metro for Jason Plummer. Mr. Plummer. A recent University of Illinois study reported that East St. Louis has a poverty rate greater than three times the state's rate of poverty. More than a third of all East St. Louis residents are reported to be living in poverty. The city's unemployment rate of 18.5 percent compares with 10.7 percent for Belleville and 10.7 percent for St. Clair County as a whole. Many people in the city feel like the rest of the state and country have written them off. 
what is your specific plan as a member of Congress to put East St. Louis back on the map economically and socially? Well, you have to have an environment where uh, you can grow jobs, where businesses want to come. And right now, it's, it's not an East St. Louis thing. It's, it's a regional thing. We've got serious problems. There's educational problems in East St. Louis. There's crime problems in East St. Louis. I was down in East St. Louis this past weekend at a Stop the Violence rally in Lincoln Park, meeting with community leaders, meeting with citizens of East St. Louis, talking about things we can do to help that area. But we aren't going to put people in East St. Louis back to work. We're not going to put people in Belleville back to work. We're not going to put people in St. Clair County back to work until there's jobs. So how do you create jobs? Well, I'd argue you send a small businessman to Washington, D.C., a small businessman that understands how public policy has negatively impacted this region. If you look at the regulations and the taxes and the heavy-handed manner in which this current administration and their allies have handled the economy and how they've handled particular industries, they've, handed, they've landed very heavily on the industries that drive the economy of Southern Illinois. We have to have a policy in place where we drive jobs from everybody in the 12th Congressional District. You know, we've laid out a jobs plan. I encourage everyone to go to my website, look at our jobs plan. I encourage everyone to go to my opponent's websites, look at their jobs plans, see where the substance is, see where the specific policy proposals are, see where the specific legislation that we would support exists, see how that would impact this area. We need true tax reform, we need regulatory reform, and we need leadership in East St. Louis that's going to stand up for those things. St. Clair County and East St. Louis have been struggling for a long time. They've been struggling under the same leadership. I think it's time perhaps in St. Clair County we have new leadership. I think perhaps it's time that we send someone to Washington, that we send people to Springfield, and we send people to the courthouse in Belleville that understand how to grow jobs, grow businesses, grow the economy, and put people in East St. Louis and everywhere else in this county back to work. Mr. Inyard. Thank you. You know, that's a difficult problem. If it were an easy problem, it would have been solved years ago. But I think that the solution there is infrastructure. You know, when we look at um, the Port Authority in Granite City, we look at the Port Authority in Sojé, we look at what's happening in Dupo, uh, we look at what's happening in Mount Vernon. Those, all of those communities, the Port Authorities particularly on the river, and I think that's most analogous to East St. Louis, those Port Authorities uh, are booming. They're bringing jobs, they're bringing industry, uh, and so I think that's uh, one way to develop East St. Louis would be to develop the infrastructure there. And if you've driven those streets, if you've been down there, you know that the infrastructure in the city of East St. Louis is crumbling. So that's where we need to go with, with development of infrastructure. Secondly, we need to develop the human infrastructure, you know, the soft infrastructure. And we have to do that through education, through skills training. The, and I, I think an additional problem in developing and redeveloping East St. Louis is the, that the property tax rate uh, in East St. Louis is so incredibly high. Uh, you'll pay uh, for a $50,000 house in East St. Louis what you would pay on a $200,000 house in Belleville or a, a $200,000 house in Swansea. And so, and that real estate property tax rate is so high because of the lack of development there. There's very little retail development, although some is starting to come back. As that retail development comes back, they'll have increased retail sales taxes, they'll have increased real estate taxes, which would be able to then lessen the real estate property tax burden. Developers don't, as uh, Mr. Plummer should know, developers don't want to come into an area where real property taxes are so high. So therefore, you're going to have to have a situation where the real estate property taxes will be set at a rate that will encourage, uh, encourage development on that riverfront. Paula Bradshaw. My dad and I were driving past East St. East St. Louis, and my dad said that in 1948, Look Magazine called East St. Louis one of the most beautiful, best places to live in the United States. So what happened to East St. Louis? I mean, it's obvious. Everyone talks about jobs. That's exactly what happens to, to East St. Louis. They, they were systematically deindustrialized just the way as the rest of the country was deindustrialized. Um, I pointed out last week that it looks as if some parts of our country have been, have been bombed by a foreign enemy. We talk a lot about defense of our country, but you know what? Parts of our cities look like they've already been bombed and there has been no defense of our country. We've allowed corporations to move 
to pack up machinery and ship it out of the country and leaving people who were gainfully employed and, and making a living for their families, they were left high and dry. I mean, you can talk about small businesses all you want, but they've had 30 years to move into East St. Louis and they haven't done it. It has to be a federal government that steps in and rebuilds not just East St. Louis, but the entire 12th district, well, the entire United States. But to, to talk about people, you know, lifting themselves by their, up by their own bootstraps or giving incentives to businessmen so they'll, so they'll come in, hasn't worked. Hasn't worked. East St. Louis is looking worse and worse. And that would be a perfect place for a Green New Deal. It needs to be cleaned up. I mean, there's pollution there. There's crumbling houses. It really, really needs to be revitalized. And a job gives people dignity. You know, you have to, you can't have people with massive unemployment and then say, well, why don't you people straighten yourselves up or something. No, you have to have you have to have jobs available so that people have the dignity of going to work and, and supporting their families and, and rebuilding their neighborhoods. And that's what I think should happen. We should have the Green New Deal and put people to work rebuilding East St. Louis and all of the riverfront, actually. The next question is from Jennifer Fuller for Bill Inyart. Mr. Inyart, one out of every four Illinois children doesn't know where he or she will get his next meal. The children's advocacy group Voices for Illinois Children reported this week that the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, uh, formerly known as food stamps, could be cut by as much as $16.5 billion over the next 10 years under provisions that, of the Farm Bill currently pending in Congress. Voices for Illinois Children says thousands of Illinois families and children would lose food assistance if these cuts are approved. Would you support or oppose those cuts to SNAP if you were elected, and why? I would, I would oppose those cuts. Um, the, uh, you know, children are our future, and we have to provide proper nutrition for them. And the Farm Bill uh, is not only designed to assist farmers, but also assist children in, in, in their nutritional needs. And this is an example of, of the uh, gridlock that's impacted Washington, D.C. And it's an example of the uh, Paul Ryan budget that Mr. Plummer uh, so embraced back in June. Um, you know, you can't fix this economy by cutting. The Wall Street Journal about six weeks ago said if you fired every single federal employee, including everyone in the military, you wouldn't cure the deficit. You would only fix about one third of the deficit. We can't get there by cutting. Now, do we need to cut some things? Yes. Is there waste in government? Yes but is cutting a nutritional program that's designed to help children the right way to go about it? I don't believe so. I think instead that what we need to do is look at a fair tax plan. We need to have millionaires who, who are not paying their fair share currently. Those millionaires need to pay their fair share of taxes. Uh, as Warren Buffett said, it's not right that I pay a smaller share of my income in taxes than does my secretary. I can't say it any better than that. Why is it that Mitt Romney pays 14% of his income in taxes, and I'll bet most of the people in this audience, the people who are firemen and policemen and teachers, pay more than 14%? Let's have the rich people pay their fair share. Let's eliminate the waste and problems, and we can get there without hurting children. Hold it. Let's wait for everyone to finish. Paula Bradshaw. I agree that the Farm Bill should be about supporting agriculture so that it can feed the people of this country, and including its children. And if we have poverty in this country because people refuse to do the Green New Deal so far, well then of course we have to have food stamps so that people don't go hungry. I mean, that's absolutely a no-brainer that people should not go hungry, but it just goes back into the entire misallocation of our resources in this country. And Martin Luther King pointed out in 1967, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military de defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And here we are 40 years later, still spending more on our military than we are on our programs of social uplift, and now talking about taking away the very basic item of life, food, and talking about polluting something else basic in life, our water. I mean, how far have we sunk? We're, we're, if we haven't approached spiritual death, we're, we're 
we're practically in murder mortar, but mortis, but <laughs> uh, I really think that it is important to make sure that our children and, and our poor people have enough to eat and have housing and have health care. Mr. Plummer. <clears throat> I would, of course, uh, oppose those provisions. You know, we've been very aggressive in talking about the Farm Bill, talking about why the Farm Bill hasn't passed. You know, that's a perfect example of where I've stepped out against the Republican Party and endorsed a discharge petition that would put a Farm Bill out there, take care of our farmers, and take care of the folks that depend on the programs that exist within the Farm Bill. It's important to have people that aren't going to turn everything into a partisan battle. But let's talk about the broader problem. Why do we have one in four children out there that aren't sure where their next meal is going to come from? It's because people don't have jobs. Paula hit the nail on the head earlier. She said jobs bring dignity. Jobs also bring opportunity. Since this president came into office, the number of people on food stamps has gone from 32 million to 47 million. One in six Americans live in poverty. If you look at what ha what's happening in this country right now, the middle class is getting crushed. America does best when the middle class is doing well. And right now, in the last three years, we see the, middle, the, the per capita income of middle class families going down $4,300. We see middle class families paying $2,500 more in health care costs. We see middle class families dropping out of the middle class. We see the middle class being squeezed because we have an administration and we have policies in place that don't enhance their opportunities. We have to have opportunities in Washington, we have to have policies in Washington, D.C. that offer these folks opportunities. How do you do that? You put people back to work. You give them the dignity that Paula was talking about. You give them the opportunity that brings their children out of poverty, that puts food on the table, sends their kids to, to school. We don't have that right now. As I said before, the unemployment here is a catastrophe. I would bet you that more than one out of four children in St. Clair County don't know where their meal's coming from because we're above the state average in all these terrible categories. We need a new policy direction. We proposed a new policy direction. And I encourage folks to go online. Compare Bill's policy proposals and compare our robust policy proposals that offer solutions and opportunity. Next question is from Beth Hunsdorfer to Jason Plummer. Mr. Plummer, women currently earn as little as 65% of what a man makes in the same job. What, what, if any, is government's role in making this more equitable? Well, I think government's role, you know, and it's something I talk about all the time, or what are those core functions of government? What are the priorities of our federal government? Or at least what should they be? And uh, I think national security is our first priority. I think infrastructure is our second priority. But we also have regulatory bodies in place that do good jobs of making sure people are treated equitably, that people are treated fairly. If, situa if situations like that arise, it's something that has to be addressed. You know, I can't speak for, for every job function out there, but I've actually studied this statistic quite a bit as a person with two older sisters who are out in the workforce right now <laughs> providing for their children. And if you look at what's happening right now, a lot of people are being harmed. It's not fair to a lot of people. The statistic that rings true to me isn't the 65% statistic. It's the fact that over one million women have lost their jobs since Barack Obama came into office. You want to talk about women losing opportunity. You want to talk about women not making money. You want to talk about a war on women. How come they are bearing the brunt of the job losses over the last four years? It's inconscionable what's happening out there right now. As I said before, we need a federal government that's providing opportunities. I don't care where you live. I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, male or female, young or old. We need opportunity. We need a federal government that's going to get out of the way of the American people and allow them to achieve the successes and achieve the dreams that they so much want. Mr. Inyard. Thank you. You know, when I served as the commander of the Illinois National Guard, a colonel got paid as a colonel. It didn't matter whether it was a he or a she. Um, my wife served as a circuit judge until she retired in, in this circuit. She was the first woman elected a circuit judge in this circuit. She got paid as a circuit judge. I think that women who are serving in equal positions to men should be served, or, or excuse me, should be paid equally to men. That's only the right thing to do. Um, I, I certainly support uh, the Lilly Ledbetter Act. And I, I think it's important for the audience to know also that Mr. Plummer, when he campaigned for lieutenant governor, ran on a platform with Senator Brady that wanted to reduce the minimum wage in Illinois. Now, I'll bet there's not very many people in the, in the audience here or in our television audience 
who would like to see the Illinois minimum wage reduced. You know, all of those folks who are flipping burgers at McDonald's or working at Walmart, are they going, they can't survive on the wages that they make now. Yet this man campaigned on a platform to reduce the minimum wage in Illinois. You know, if women aren't making 65% of what a man makes, are they, going to, uh, are they going to be able to survive on a reduced minimum wage? I really think not. I don't think that's the way this country needs to go. I think it's equal work for equal pay. Paula Bradshaw. Well, of course, I think women should make as much as men, <laughs> um, especially because so many uh, there are so many single mothers out there who are struggling to take care of their children, play, pay daycare. They don't have time to feed them, so they go out to fast food places. I mean, peop women have it hard, even if they're married, but when they're single parents, and a lot of women are, it's even worse. So I, not only don't I think the minimum wage should be lowered, I think it should be raised because how do you expect to have a vibrant economy if people don't have money? You know, you, everyone talks about, well, we're going to bring prosperity to this country. Well, you can't have prosperity unless there's circulating money in the economy, and there's not going to be circulating money in the economy if it's all being hoarded in Swiss bank accounts by the 1%. You know, you have to have a raising of the minimum wage. You have to have equality in wages. You have to make sure that there's paid maternity leave. You have to make sure that there is a, a decent working standard for everybody with safe working conditions. There's a lot of things besides the disparity in wages that are wrong with our working conditions in this country today. And yeah, you talk about Walmart, they treat their workers really bad. And so does McDonald's and Burger King. And I'm sorry if I'm calling people out and I'm missing some because you know there's more of you out there. Um, I think that we really need to have more unions, more people standing up for themselves, an increase in the minimum wage, and uh, fair and equal wages for women and men. Gary Metro has the next question for Bill Enyart. Mr. Enyart, there's been a great deal of discussion nationwide about the lack of stability or the level of stability in the Middle, in the Middle East. It can be argued that Iran and Israel are on a collision course. It also can be argued that what initially was celebrated as a movement toward democracy, the so-called Arab Spring, has evolved into a threat to American security. As a member of Congress, what path would you recommend for the nation as the proper course of action in the Middle East? Gary, that's a, a difficult question. You know, it's a difficult question because we've seen constant strife in the Middle East uh, for centuries. Um, the, frankly, I believe that, uh, and the Wall Street Journal today, there was, there was an article about uh, Iraq, or, or excuse me, Iran, and where Iran is in terms of the development of a nuclear weapon. Uh, they currently uh, have nearly enough enriched uranium to develop that nuclear weapon. Uh, we have nuclear states uh, surrounding, uh, not surrounding, but very, very close to Iran. Pakistan is a nuclear armed state. India is a nuclear armed state. Those are very, uh, very unstable, very fragile countries. I think that what we have to work towards uh, is developing a stable uh, system of governance in those countries. When you have change, particularly in change, change in societies that are so stratified, it's a problem. You know, but in many ways, we're much better off than we were 10 years ago. When I was in the Army War College, one of the projects I had to perform, and, and that's the final course that you take before you become a general officer, uh, one of the tasks that I had to perform was to plan the invasion of Libya. And we had to plan the invasion of Libya because we knew that Muammar Gaddafi had biological weapons. He had weapons of mass destruction. So although you may argue about what happened in Iraq, one of the truly good things that happened with the Iraq invasion was that it scared the death out of Muammar Gaddafi that he would be next on the U.S.'s list. And so he turned over those weapons of mass destruction and allowed us to destroy them. So there has been some progress. So what we have to understand is that that's going to be a a hard birth, you know, moving from the Time. dictatorships. Sorry. Thank you very much. Paula Bradshaw. 
this is another thing where we are getting, it's not, the United States is not entitled to interfere in other people's sovereign nations. And that used to be a Republican position, by the way. It used to be the Republicans that were anti-interventionists, that were America firsters. The idea that the United States has the right to go into other countries and tell them how to run their countries is, is a, a sense of entitlement that I think is arrogant and unwarranted. Um, Iran has been, we've been told that Iran has been five years away from a nuclear weapon since 1979. The Christian Science Monitor has, has gone over all the times that we have been told they're five years away from a nuclear weapon. it has been 33 years we've been told this. The last, the most recent was Cheney in 2006 telling us that Iran was five years away from having a nuclear weapon. Well, we're six years later and now Obama and friends are busy announcing that Iran is five years away. How long are people going to fall for this? At some point, are you going to wake up and say, you know what, they're lying to us, just like they lied about Iraq. You know, it is absolutely ridiculous for the United States to go in and destabilize the Middle East because all it does is bring grief, misery, death, and destruction to those people over there. It, we've been overthrowing secular governments and putting Muslim fundamentalists in charge of Iraq and Libya. Now we're threatening Syria. Um, we're threatening Iran. At what point are people, Americans going to stand up and say, this is enough. Mind your own business. We'll turn to, our, to sustainable energy. We won't have to worry about their oil. They can, they can argue among themselves. It's their business. It's not our business. We need a Green New Deal so that we get off fossil fuels and we don't have to take other people's property. Jason Plummer. Well, what's happening overseas is quite frightening right now. You know, it's, it's something we look at all the time in the military. Uh, we can look at what's happening in country by country by country, but, but let's look at the Mideast first and then let's look at the bigger picture. You know, um, Iraq is, uh, is getting worse by the week, if you watch the news reports. We pulled our footprint out of Iraq. We didn't have the longer term strategy that, that, that President Obama uh, tried to get but, but failed to get in diplomatic nego negotiations. If you look at what's happening in Afghanistan, we're withdrawing from Afghanistan. But look at the countries that our military forces aren't in right now. Look at what's happening in Iran. The day that Iran gets a nuclear weapon, and it's not five years, it's, it's about a year or less, but the day that Iran gets a nuclear weapon is the day every conversation we have going forward changes dramatically. Look at what's happened in Egypt. Uh, I don't think anyone here would argue that, uh, that uh, Egypt was, was probably a, a grand democracy or that Hosni Mubarak was, was a great guy. But Hosni Mubarak was a friend to America and a friend to Israel, and he kept peace in a really tough corner of the world for a long time. And we stepped back and threw him under the bus, and now we see the direction Egypt's going. It's quite frightening. If you look at what's happening in Syria, the Syrian government has American blood on its hands. Syrian government now has Syrian blood on its hands. Assad has weapons of mass destruction. They're starting to infringe on the territory of our friends like Turkey and Jordan. It's quite frightening. The problem is America has no foreign policy right now. There's uncertainty across the globe. Our friends don't know if we're going to stand with them. Our enemies, as we see in Libya, clearly don't mind provoking us. And while the Mideast burns and there's a lack of direction out of Washington, we see Russia grow. We see China grow. China is infringing on the territorial uh, uh, lands of, of Japan, of Taiwan, of Vietnam, of the Philippines as we speak. We need leadership in Washington that's not just going to turn things around Time. domestically, but they're going to provide guidance to our friends overseas. Thank you. Next question comes from Jennifer Fuller for Paula Bradshaw. Ms. Bradshaw, voters say they're tired of negative campaigning and they worry that the bad feelings will continue into the next session of Congress. Please name one idea or program your opponents have suggested that you could reach across the aisle and support. Well, for Bill Inyard, I would say f fair taxation. Uh, he, he thinks that, that um, our unfair tax system should be changed and I would agree with that. Well, Jason, <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to think here. Um, <laughs> I don't mean to be rude. Civility. Civility, yeah, civility. Um, but that's not really your platform. Um, Actually, it is. 
they're trying to tell me it down there. There's something, there's something. I just can't think of it right now. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> well, there'll be time in the rebuttal if we still have time in the rebuttal. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Jason. I can't think of any of your programs that I could go along with, you know. Sorry. <laughs> Jason, Jason Plummer's response is next. Jason, maybe you can th come up with something. <laughs> well, I would say right off the bat, you know, uh, I, I've got a tremendous amount of respect for someone that's going to go out there and, and talk about the issues they believe in. Um, I, I think Paula does that day in, day out. Uh, I said civility to Paula because I really respect the way she handles herself. I really respect the way she campaigns. And um, if we sent more people like Paula to Washington that's willing to sit down in a civil manner, have a robust discussion with people they agree with and people they disagree with, I think we'd break the gridlock that we see in Washington. That's something I definitely aim to do. Is that an endorsement? What's that? Is that an endorsement? We can, <laughs> we can talk after the debate. Uh, but, uh, but we need... But, but we need people like that in Washington. I think that uh, the, the, the ideas that we've laid out are, are, are along the same lines in terms of working together, uh, no matter what a person believes on the issues. In, in terms of Bill, you know, I think that um, I, I give Bill a lot of credit for his military service. Anybody that's willing to, to put the uniform on, uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for that. I, I think Bill has um, the best interest of, of our military in mind, and uh, I, uh, I respect that. All right. Bill Inyard. Thank you. You know, someone who's had uh, more than $1.2 million uh, spent on, uh, on attack ads against me by uh, uh, folks who own casinos in China and uh, are under investigation by the federal government, I certainly appreciate uh, uh, that, that question. Uh, it's never pleasant to, uh, to have someone you've never heard of uh, uh, spending $1.2 million to uh, slander you. But uh, I, I would say that for Mr. Plummer, um, uh, his uh, position on infrastructure is certainly something that, uh, that we agree on. Uh, we, uh, we each uh, believe that infrastructure uh, needs to be improved in the district. Uh, unfortunately, but with his backing of the Paul Ryan budget and, and the Romney budget, uh, they're going to slash infrastructure spending by 30 percent. So, but I do agree with the infrastructure. As for Paula, I, I greatly admire her passion for the environment. Um, I, uh, I agree with her uh, desire for increased research in clean energy. And, uh, you know, as, as a guy who likes to hike, uh, uh, according to the Belleville News Democrat, and, uh, and a guy who likes to ride a bicycle, uh, I support her on increasing bike paths in the district. All right. We're at the... Uh we're at the point right now in the debate where we'd like to give each of the candidates two minutes to rebut anything that you need, uh, you believe needs to be addressed. We'll start with Paula Bradshaw. Well, I take issue with my opponent's jobs plans. The um, idea that cutting taxes will lead to increased tax income was called voodoo economics by George Sr. Bush. Uh, way back in 1980 when Reagan first proposed it, and he was proven right when Reagan ran up the biggest federal deficit that this country had ever seen, bigger than all other presidents combined. So he was proven right, and then his son gets into office and cuts taxes more and runs up the deficit more than Reagan and everybody else combined. And I realize that Obama is now uh, made it even worse. So obviously, cutting taxes for the rich uh, does not make for more money income in the United States. And then we, uh, as far as regulation goes, or deregulation, I think the Wall Street crash of 2008 shows that when you deregulate the, for the banking industry, just for one, they go on a crime wave. And they also went on a crime wave, crime wave in the 1980s, but at least then they were prosecuted. 1,200 bankers went to jail for their banking crimes in the 80s, and not one has gone to jail under the Obama administration. Obama gets up there and says, well, you know, I would love, it was immoral, but it wasn't illegal. Yeah, it was illegal. These things are illegal, and if we need a president and an attorney general who will prosecute, prosecute criminals, we definitely don't need to do what the Republicans do and look at a crime wave and go, wow, we need to get rid, we need to make that legal. 
you know, that's the wrong thing. And then the Democrats want to just ignore the crimes and funnel more money to them under this, uh, giving them more money for municipal bonds, which the Wall Street takes and makes a lot of money off of, and public-private partnerships. That's when the public pays and the private profits. So I disagree with both of them. We know what works. The New Deal of, of FDR put millions of people to work within months. We can do it again. That's what I call for. The next rebuttal is from Jason Plummer. Well, I, I, I like the way you did this, Jack. You, you asked us to compliment each other. Now we have to rebut each other. So it's uh, <laughs> interesting timing. Look, I, I, one thing that if you've been to the debates, you probably hear me say, uh, have said before is pretty simple. If you're not going to be honest with the voters, when you're asking them for their vote, how are you going to treat them if you win? And let me tell you, I've been pretty stunned at some of the things Bill said here. And I encourage people to go look at the media. Go look at the Belvin News Democrat or the Southern Illinois and listen to the radio stations or the TV stations. I have never endorsed the Ryan Plan. And any time Bill Inert says that I've endorsed the Ryan Plan, he's not being honest with you. I've never endorsed tax cuts for companies that are going to ship jobs overseas. Our family business creates jobs in Southern Illinois, none overseas. When Bill Inert says that to you, he's not being honest with you. You want to, the woe is me story about the $1.2 million in attack ads Cry me a river, there's only one campaign on this stage that's had TV commercials pulled because they're not being honest. Folks, we need honesty, we need leadership. You know, Bill said something about me campaigning on a platform to reduce minimum wage. Our family businesses, my personal businesses employ over a thousand people in the region. Not a single one of them makes the minimum wage. They all make well above the minimum wage. They get 401ks, health insurance, profit sharing. We take care of our employees. And to listen to these stories, it's ridiculous. People see Congress with an approval rating at 13 or 14 percent. People wonder why is Congress's approval rating at 13 or 14 percent? It's because of junk like that. People want solutions. People want answers. People want honesty. You know, I'm not going to stand up here and have people say things about me that aren't true. I've never endorsed the Ryan Plan. I don't support tax cuts for companies that ship jobs overseas. I don't support tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires and private jet owners. I don't support uh, lowering the minimum wage and anything else you come up with. Bill, enough is enough. The voters want answers. They don't want to tax. Wait. Let's hold the, appla Let's hold the applause for the last one. Bill Enyart, response. June 12th. Alton, Illinois Town Hall. Look it up on the internet, it's there. Now, let's talk a little bit about, about East St. Louis. And part of the reason for the collapse in East St. Louis is exactly what Jason Plummer now denies, and that is that manufacturing companies, companies in this country have received a tax deduction for closing plants here and shipping jobs overseas. Now, additionally, uh, Mr. Plummer has consistently supported the repeal of affordable health care. That was voted on 33 times by the Republican-controlled Congress, never went anywhere at a cost of $50 million to the taxpayers of this country. Now, the Farm Bill, which he says, oh, I su supported pulling out uh, uh, and putting on the table, well, the Farm Bill was never voted on once, although Speaker Boehner came here and had a $1,000 a plate or a $1,000 a table fundraiser for Mr. Plummer. I'm not sure what they talked about at that, at that uh, luncheon. Now, let me address this, though, uh, to the Belleville News Democrat. In this morning's editorial, there was one question the News Democrat wanted me to answer and one for Mr. Plummer. Now, the News Democrat said, don't hold your breath for an answer. They want me to say who contacted me initially about running for Congress. They want Mr. Plummer to release his tax returns. Beth Hunstorfer, hold your breath right now. Terry Beach, Director of Economic Development for St. Clair St uh, County, please stand up. I know you're in the audience somewhere, Terry. All right, Terry is, Terry is the person. Now, Mr. Plummer, it's your turn. Are you going to let Beth breathe? Okay, we need to move on. Back to questions from the panelists. The next question comes from Beth Hunsdorfer for Bill Inyard. 
Federal and state money has poured into failing school districts such as East St. Louis that have failed to meet federal standards for years. What do you think Congress can or should do to improve education for local children? You know, I think that, and, and my daughter-in-law is, is a teacher uh, right here in Belleville. Uh, my mother-in-law taught school in Cahokia for 36 years. I think that local control of education is very important. Uh, I don't believe that the federal government, uh, you know, the No Child uh, Left Behind Act is, it, in my view, an abysmal failure. The, that, that act has forced teachers, and my daughter-in-law has talked to me about that. She's, she's expressed concern that she spends days teaching kids to the test. She doesn't teach kids how to make wise decisions, how to, how to be informed citizens. Instead, she has to teach them rote memory so they can pass that test. Uh, I think that, that local education should be controlled by local citizens rather than dictated to by the federal government. So the, the solution lies, you know, Hillary Clinton said it great in, in a great manner that, uh, that it takes a village to raise a child. And what we need to do is strengthen families. We need to, to, to uh, lessen the, the, the violence that kids are exposed to on the streets and on television, and that's how we're gonna educate kids. Paula Bradshaw. Well, I think that uh, the attacks on our schools, not just with No Child Left Behind, but also Race to the Top, are another example of how American as a society are failing our children. The one of the first being all our children living in poverty, all our children face facing hunger from decreasing food stamps. Um, we know how to help children learn. It doesn't start at, at five years old. It doesn't even start at three years old. It starts at birth. And we know that people that talk to their children, carry their children around, um, nurture their children, love their children, those children are more verbal, those children are more engaged, those children learn language, those children learn their names, their colors, their alphabet, their, their numbers. Those children are going to do better when they go to school. So we have to make sure that every parent that has a child, number one, every child should be a wanted child, and number two, every child should be a nurtured child. So we have to teach parents how to be good parents. We have to give parents paid maternity leave so they aren't dropping their six-week-old off in a daycare while they go back to work at a minimum wage job, which happens all the time. You know, people in this country are not, children in this country are not nurtured. They're not provided for. They're not cared for, and it seems like they're disposable to me. Like, like we live in a disposable society, and our children are just one more thing that if they don't, if they don't measure up to the race to the top, then they're just disposed of, and that's just wrong. There's absolutely no reason that every child in this country shouldn't be wanted, nurtured, loved, fed, housed, and, ha and have a good start in life. Jason Plummer. <clears throat> I, you know, uh, both my parents were actually teachers. I, I've got a lot of friends uh, that, that, that teach, and, and, and you hear the same complaint from teachers that you hear from doctors, that you hear from small businessmen, that you hear from coal miners, that you hear from everybody else. The federal government's getting in the way. I think these are decisions that have to be made at the local level. I think that even if the federal government participates in funding, those dollars should be spent at the discretion of the folks at the local level. Paul is exactly right. It starts with strong families. It starts with the nurturing of children. But once they get into schools, they need to make sure the resources are there, but they also need to make sure that the decisions are being made locally, not by bureaucrats out in Washington, D.C. It's like the opening statement. Do you think a large federal bureaucracy in Washington makes the best decisions for you and your children? Or do you think your family does, the folks at the local level? So that's what we need to do to improve the educational situation. Now, I, I have a little bit of extra time here, so, so we have to go back to something. You know, Beth, the Belvin News Democrat, did ask why I won't release my tax returns. Bill is pretty proud of that. Well, it's because I don't think that it's public information. Anything that people want to know about my assets, my investments, any liabilities, anything I have, it's all public information. You can go look it up. Now, Bill stands here and attacks me on the tax return thing. He's pretty proud of that. But I guess my question would be, you know, Bill, why do you take so much money from people that refuse to show their tax returns, like Nancy Pelosi? In fact, on Sunday, Jan Schakowsky, the most liberal member of Congress, is coming down here to raise money for Bill. Not only will Jan Schakowsky not show her taxes, but her husband went to prison for check kiting and tax charges. Now, Bill, are you going to raise money from Jan Schakowsky while attacking me for this? 
Are you going to look into the eyes of these people and take money from Nancy Pelosi, then deny taking money from Nancy Pelosi? The, at the last debate, when Bill Inyart was saying, I haven't taken money from Nancy Pelosi, she was hosting a fundraiser for him in Washington, D.C. If you're not going to be honest with the voters when you're asking for their vote, how are you going to treat them if you win? The next question comes from Gary Metro for Paula Bradshaw. Ms. Bradshaw, what has surprised you the most about your opponents during this campaign for the 12th Congressional District seat? Have you been impressed by the level of civility shown by your, by your opponents, or have you been disappointed? Talk about some of the specifics and the impact it's had on your campaign and on your life. I didn't know Jason was so tall. <laughs> And he has been very, very polite um, at all times and civil, and I do appreciate that. Bill has been polite to me, maybe not so much to Jason. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's not going to take me two minutes. That's what I'm saying. That, um, I, you know, I, I was actually surprised that both of them would be so pro-military, and because um, I thought that Democrats were supposed to be more pro-peace, and I thought Republicans were supposed to be more nationalistic. But you know, there you go. You're surprised by both parties. But I have nothing else to say. Okay, thank you, uh, Jason Plummer. Could you could you repeat the question one more time? What has surprised you the most about your opponents during this campaign for the 12th congressional district seat? You know, you I, I've really um, enjoyed the opportunity to get to know Paula, uh, her staff, her husband Rich Whitney, who's ran statewide for office before on the Green Party. Um, clearly we have some policy differences, but uh, again, policy differences shouldn't get in the way of being able to, to build relationships and uh, learn from each other. I, I've learned a tremendous amount from, from Paula and um, her, her campaign. Uh, I, I, I hope I've rubbed off on them a little bit, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. You know, um, Bill, um, you know, I mean, I, I guess to be honest with you, uh, being in the military, um, I just expected a little bit more. Um, you know, I think the American people, the people of Southern Illinois, are thirsting for substantive conversations about the issues that are really impacting them. I think we're trying to deliver those things. You know, you're never going to see a TV commercial for Jason Plummer yanked off air because it's not being honest. You're never going to see uh, uh, us get in trouble for distorting anything. I can't speak for everything that's out there, but we try to be um, uh, positive and we try to be honest. But at the end of the day, you do have to defend yourself. And, and just the constant boilerplate, Washington, D.C., talking points and exaggerations and distortions, it just gets old. But at the end of the day, I think it benefits us because it doesn't just get old to me. It gets old to the people in the audience. It gets old to the people in Southern Illinois that are truly hurting out there, and they want solutions. Bill Inyard. Could you repeat the question, please? What has impressed you, what has surprised you the most about your opponents during this campaign for the 12th Congressional District seat? Have you been impressed by the level of civility shown by your opponents, or have you been disappointed? Talk about some of the specifics and the impact it's had on your campaign and on your life? Um, Paula has been a delight. I, I really enjoy Paula. Um, I'm certainly glad to hear that Nancy Pelosi had a fundraiser for me in Washington, D.C. last week. Uh, I wasn't aware of it. Uh, I didn't hear about it, but I'll, I'll eagerly look forward to receiving her check when it comes. <laughs> you know, if I'd known that uh, Sheldon Adelson uh, and the, uh, the Chinese uh, 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 Gambling Tycoon was going to spend $1.2 million against me, along with the other Republicans in attack ads. You know, they could have offered me the money, and maybe I would have sat home. Uh, but uh, uh, they didn't do that. Frankly, I, I'm astounded that, that Mr. Plummer can sit here and call me a liar when, uh, when I, I don't know anything about a TV commercial not being uh, played that was mine. Uh, but, uh, you know, his television commercials, the only thing I see, the only thing anybody in this audience has seen on TV in St. Louis or in the other markets for the last two weeks has been attack ads against me. You know, I have a story to tell. You've seen my television commercials. I have a story to tell. You know, I'm a working class kid. I've been a success. I know what it's like to pay back a student loan. Mr. Plummer uh, lies to you. You know, he talks about his federal election disclosure. Those, those are ranges. They don't tell you anything. Uh, you know, 
he, 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 I don't care what he made. I know that he made somewhere between $946,000 and $5 million last year. But what I care is what he paid. You know, let's have some tax fairness in we're, this country. We're, uh, I, uh, you know, I pointed out, I pointed out numerous positions where he's been dishonest. Where exactly have I lied, Bill? What have I lied about? I'll let you go ahead and answer. Thank you. Um, Nancy Pelosi's fundraiser, I know nothing about Nancy Pelosi fundraiser for me. I wasn't invited. I know nothing about it. We'll be more Television, than happy. To, we'll may be I answer the, the question, please, We'll be sir. more than happy to send a copy One of the time. invite. One with at a time. You know, and most lieutenant junior grades will refer to someone older than him as sir, or maybe not Bill. Huh? Okay. I refer to Mr. Plummer as Mr. Plummer out of, out of some modicum of respect. Thank you. Paula, anything on your part? Well, I'm glad to have this lesson in civility here right up on stage. <laughs> OK, let's move along. We still have uh, time for more questions from the panel. Jennifer Fuller to Jason Plummer. Mr. Plummer, as the fiscal cliff of December 31st approaches with the end of tax breaks, the start of new taxes, and mandatory spending cuts, there remains a large and unanswered question. Does the federal government have a spending problem, or is it more a problem of not bringing in enough money to support these needed operations? Please give some specifics when you explain your answer. Well, it, it, it's a combination of both. Obviously, the federal government has spending problems. Look, we're going to spend $3.5 trillion this year. $2.5 trillion of the $3.5 trillion goes to Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and interest on the debt. That leaves $1 trillion for everything else the federal government does. Infrastructure spending, education, the military, FBI, you name it, anything outside of those four things, $1 trillion. Our deficit this year is going to be about $1.2 trillion, which means that we could shut down everything the federal government does. We could lay off all federal employees. We could just take care of Medicaid, Medicare, interest on the debt, Social Security, and we would still run a deficit. If that's not a perfect example of a spending problem, I don't know what is. Uh, we've had deficits of over a trillion dollars four years in a row. Things are out of control. We've got to get the spending under control. Now, we do need more revenue to Washington. Now, the question is, how do you generate more revenue to Washington? I think that that's a key decision in this debate. Uh, my opponent thinks that we need to raise taxes on everybody. Obamacare, a trillion dollars in new taxes. Tax rates on middle class going up. Tax rates on the businesses that employ 54% of the American people go up. But I argue we need to expand the economy. We need to get rid of loopholes and deductions that people take advantage of. We need to bring the rates down. When more people are working, when more people are earning a paycheck, more people are paying taxes, and we drive revenue to Washington. Look at what, what's happened in Illinois. It's a prime example of a, a, a state of a, a body of government that's controlled by people that don't understand basic economics. They're destroying the economy. They're destroying our, our businesses. They're destroying our communities. They're tearing our families apart. We need fiscal sanity in Washington. We don't get fiscal sanity by punishing the people of America because the, the, the leadership in Washington doesn't know how to spend properly. Spending needs to get under control, but we need a tax environment. We need a tax code that isn't 72,000 pages and growing. We need a tax code that drives economic activity. Hi. Please, Bill Enyart's response. Well, Mr. Plummer and I agree here. I think it's uh, uh, a problem on both ends. Um, we do need increased revenue, and we do need some spending cuts. And you know, the problem began with, uh, we had a balanced budget under Bill Clinton. George Bush comes into office, gets us into two wars, and cuts taxes on millionaires. Now, what we need to do is have a fair tax system in this country. Now, maybe I would like to have, and maybe all of us in the audience would like to have the same tax rate as Mr. Plummer does, but we don't know what his tax rate is because he won't tell us. <laughs> Beth, are you breathing yet? Are you breathing, Beth? Okay. Now, um, once again, Mr. Plummer, though, is misrepresenting entirely my position uh, in regard to tax cuts. I don't advocate advocate, or excuse me, in regard to tax increases, I don't advocate tax increases on middle class people or on working people, but I do think that millionaires ought to pay their fair share. Now, when you, you can't fight two wars and cut taxes. President Bush was the only president in history who has ever done that. You know, and some of our greatest, greatest uh, economic growth was during the 50s. Do you know what the 
top tax rate in the 50s was? 90%. Mr. Plummer's arguments don't hold water. Maybe he needs to go back and restudy it for his bachelor's degree in finance, but that doesn't hold water. You know, the 60s, look at the 60s. We had great economic growth in the, in the 60s, but what were the tax rates then? The marginal tax rates were far, far higher than they are today. His arguments don't hold water. What we do need to do, we do need to eliminate waste, we do need to increase revenues, and that can be done if, if people like Mr. Plummer, perhaps, but certainly Mitt Romney and Warren Buffett pay their fair share. Corporations, General Electric last year paid zero dollars, making billions of dollars in profit. Now, the mom and pop corporations that I represented when I was a lawyer, Time. they- Thank you very much. Paula Bradshaw, response. Well, I agree with Bill that the Bush tax cuts were a mistake, as I pointed out, so were the Reagan tax cuts, but I would have to point out that Obama and the Democrats extended those tax cuts in 2010, so we can no longer blame them solely on Bush, and Obama has expanded the wars, and, and they are unpaid, so we can no longer just blame this all on Bush. But I do take very strong issue with the idea that Social Security and Medicare are part of the federal budget, and they are driving the federal budget into deficit. It. They are not part of the federal budget. You can look at your paycheck if you have one. You can see you pay federal income taxes. That's to, to support the government. You pay Social Security taxes. That is to support disabled and elderly and retired people and, and widows and orphans. And you pay Medicare taxes, and that is to pay Medicare. So it is, it is disingenuous for the two parties to pretend that Social Security and Medicare are contributing to our federal deficit. Now, as far as uh, as I pointed out, the military was doubled. We doubled our spending on the military from 2000, from the year 2000. We could cut it in half, be right back to where we were in 2000, and save $360 billion a year. We could tax the rich fairly. The 1% are sitting on $2 trillion stashed in overseas banks in Cayman Islands and Switzerland. They can't even invest it. Job creators, I don't think so. They're just sitting on that money. They need to be taxed. We need to get that money and put it to use helping the people of this country. We need to tax financial speculation. Why do we pay 8% sales tax on everything we buy, but the Wall Street speculators who brought the entire world economy down don't pay one single sales tax cent on financial gambling? We pay sin taxes on alcohol, cigarettes, and our lottery. Why don't they pay sin taxes on their gambling? And the other thing I would say is have the corporations pay their, their fair share. Why aren't they, why are they, uh, not only don't pay taxes, some of them get rebates. This is ridiculous. Thank you. We're moving right along in the format. Uh, we do have time for one more question from our panel. This is going to come from Beth Hunsdorfer from the Belleville News Democrat. And uh, the first question will, uh, the question will first go to Bill Inyart. The 12th Congressional District is diverse in a number of ways but economic disparities are evident across the board. How do you level the playing field and provide opportunities for blighted communities throughout the district to once again thrive? Beth, I think the reason, I, th I think the way to solve that problem is by building the infrastructure, by building the hard infrastructure and building the soft infrastructure. The, you know, when, when you go to Mount Vernon, uh, Mount Vernon, you can't pull onto Highway uh, uh, 15 at 5 o'clock in the afternoon because the traffic is so thick. Mayor Chesley over there told me a couple of months ago when I visited with her that they're going to have 1,200 new jobs in the Mount Vernon area between 2011 and 2013. The reason for that is because of the infrastructure. The interstate highways crossing, and they, they have two interstate highways there, and they have three Class A rail lines. That's bringing jobs, it's bringing development. The same thing is occurring down at Marion with, with uh, Interstates 57 and 24 and, and Illinois 13. You see the same thing happening in the warehouse district just west of 255 and just north of 270 uh, west of Edwardsville in the district. You see, a great develop, you see great development and, and great economic activity there because of the infrastructure. The river is right there in the port districts. So we need to build that physical in infrastructure. We, but, and the, the Ryan budget, which my, my opponent endorsed, although he denies it now, 
uh, cuts it by 30%, cuts that spending by 30%. Now, you also need to develop the soft infrastructure. That's the education, that's the technical skills, that's the training. I was down at the uh, Southern Illinois University Coal Research Facility last week and met with the director. And one of the problems that they're having uh, in developing uh, clean uses for coal is that they simply can't get enough workers with the technical skills, the highly skilled welders, the highly skilled machinists, the people with those uh, hard skills to perform the delicate work that needs to be done. So as a result of that, oh, Red. Thank Sorry. you. Paula Bradshaw. I'm for building infrastructure too. I'm for building infrastructure for the 21st century and not doubling down on the fossil fuel based infrastructure that we've had for the last 60 years. With endless highways, devastated neighborhoods, parents who don't know their kids because they're sitting in traffic. You know, this kind of uh, fossil based fuel fueled infrastructure that we've had for the last 60 years has led to nothing but urban, urban sprawl traffic and misery. I say we build an infrastructure for the 21st century with sustainable transportation, renewable energy, compact cities, uh, rail lines, all the kind of things that make for a pleasant environment for our people. And I would like to say that this isn't something that we would have to start all over with. We already have a law on our books to put people to work. The Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment Act, which was passed in 1978 with the support of then Representative Paul Simon, calls for the federal government to step in when unemployment, unemployment rises over 3%. When the job creators in the private sector don't step up to the plate, well then the government is supposed to. This law is on our books. Why is, why are, it, why is it not being enforced? Why is the president not enforcing it? Why is Congress not enforcing it? Why are we told that 7.8 unemployment, you know, we dropped to 7.8 unemployment and we're all supposed to, you know, jump around. It's a great leap forward or something. No, anything over 3%, the government's supposed to jump in and, and create direct employment by the government. So we, that's what we need to do. We need to rebuild our, our infrastructure for the 21st century and quit doubling down on the fossil fuel-based infrastructure. Fossil fuels are dirty, they're destructive, they're causing global warming, and we're running out of them anyhow. So, Jason Plummer. Well, if we're going to bring opportunity and prosperity back to the, the small communities that have been devastated, you know, you look at Franklin County, 102 counties in the state of Illinois, Franklin County, highest unemployment rate, Another company just announced that they were shutting down. That's over 300 jobs leaving Franklin County. If you look at what's happening, it's devastating. Out of those 102 counties, the worst five in terms of the unemployment rate, 12th Congressional District. The communities in Southern Illinois are being hammered. The counties in Southern Illinois are being hammered. But most importantly, the families of Southern Illinois are being hammered. You see kids graduate high school, they feel that they can't plant their roots and get opportunity, so they move, they move out of state. You see folks come back from the military. They can't find opportunity. They can't find jobs. They move out of state. 50% of the kids that graduate from college right now can't find jobs. You're not going to grow your communities. You're not going to grow uh, Southern Illinois unless you take care of the people of Southern Illinois. And right now, the middle class is getting hammered. Right now, Southern Illinois is getting hammered. Why are they getting hammered? Well, it's just like I said in the opening statement. The policies, the regulations, the taxes, this administration and their allies are pushing onto the American people, land heavy on everybody, but they land especially hard on the industries that drive the economy of Southern Illinois. We've gone from 37 coal mines 20 years ago to less than 10 coal mines. You want to know by, why Benton and West Frankfurt, why, why Mount Vernon, why, why Pinckneyville and Duquoin are struggling? The jobs are gone. The families can't find jobs. The people that want to work can't find jobs. We have to have a robust pro-jobs, pro-business, pro-economic growth policy in Washington, D.C. That's the choice this election cycle. Do you want true tax reform that drives jobs? Do you want true reform that brings opportunity to the middle class? Or do you want to continue to double down on the failed policy that's caused 11% unemployment rate in St. Clair County, that's caused 10.5% unemployment rate in the 12th Congressional District? We need to have these conversations, but most importantly, we need elected officials who are going to go to Washington, D.C., and to Springfield for that matter, and are actually going to fight for the solutions that help the families of Southern Illinois. Now it's time to uh, get some of your questions up here, which were turned in uh, just before we took the air. 
First question is uh, for Paula Bradshaw, and these are 30-second answers for everybody. This is what we call the lightning round. First one to Paula, a budget must be balanced in some fashion, but first, a budget is a moral document. What are the proper purposes for our federal government to uh, use federal money to fund? And conversely, which is not a moral thing for our federal government to fund? I think I've already talked about that. I think that a government should make sure that its people are fed, number one. I mean, 10,000 years ago when agriculture was invented and we got the first so-called civilization, it was based on people being fed. It was based on that the people, the ruling class in charge, fed the people and that's how they managed to stay in charge. If, if your government doesn't even do that, you can ask Louis XVI what happens when you don't even feed your people. And after that, they should provide for security, health, education. Mr. Plummer. <clears throat> well, you have to look at what, what the core functions of government are, national security, infrastructure. Other than that, I think the American people uh, should be the driving force here. The American people want to be the driving force here. Uh, the problem right now is that we're, we're not providing that opportunity, and the people that need it the most are the ones that are getting harmed the most. Uh, we've got real problems. We need to make sure that we aggressively go after these issues. Uh, if, if you look at, at what we see in Washington, D.C., all decisions should go back to two things. One, does it grow jobs or does it grow government? And two, in terms of spending, I need to wrap it up. In terms of spending, is it worth spending the money if we have to go to China to borrow it for that particular program? Mr. Enyart, your response. I think the definition of that would be we must spend for the common good. You know, this nation was, was uh, built upon our Constitution, and we must look to what is the common good for the people. And the common good for the people would be uh, the defense of the nation, the, the preservation of society, uh, building infrastructure. Uh, congressmen get to write tax laws, and so congressmen need to be open and transparent about their taxes. Next question. What, and this first question goes, this next question goes to Jason Plummer. What is your position on maintaining Medicare and Social Security? <clears throat> we have to maintain those. You know, I say all the time, where I come from, a promise made is a promise kept. And uh, look, uh, Paula, from what I understand, has never uh, supported anything that's going to gut those programs, nor have I. If you support Obamacare, you support a program that's going to cut $716 billion from Medicare per the president, per his Secretary of Health and Human Services. And it's not just $716 billion nationally, it's $1.7 billion from Medicare from seniors in the 12th Congressional District. It's $535 million from Medicare for seniors in St. Clair County. Mr. Don't boo me, boo the administration. Mr. Enyart's response. Thank you. Once again, Mr. Plummer is misrepresenting facts. Uh, he talks often about this $716 million, billion. That same $716 billion appears in the Paul Ryan budget, which he fully embraced on June 12th in Alton, Illinois. The, 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 and additionally, that $716 billion doesn't come out of Medicare or Social Security. It is a no, he just gave it. You still have. Oh, very good. About 10 uh, seconds. It, 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 re, it comes out of subsidies to insurance companies rather and uh, uh, subsidies to hospitals, not out of the pockets of seniors. Okay, Ms. Ms. Bradshaw. Well, I've already talked about Medicare and Social Security. They're separate programs, and I want them to be continued. I got my Social Security thing in the mail, and it turns out that over 40 years of working, I've put in $16,000 to Medicare. $16,000 over, that's $400 a year, to take care of uh, our elderly people in this country. Obamacare, I don't care what John Roberts says, is not a tax. It is a subsidy to the private insurance companies. They want me to pay $537 a month. $537 a month compared to $16,000 over 40 years. Okay, next question. This one goes, first of all, to Bill Inyert. Do you believe that concealed carry is a constitutional right? What the Constitution says, what the Second Amendment says, is that Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people to keep and bear arms. That is the constitutional language that is contained therein. The uh, question of concealed carry is a question of state law, and each state uh, makes that determination. I think that most people would 
I think that most people would prefer to have their state make that determination rather than have the federal government, as Mr. Plummer says, once again make overarching decisions for all of us. Next one, uh, next response is from Paula Bradshaw. I really don't think that the states can overthrow the Constitution. If it's a constitutional right, I don't think states can pass, you know, laws that overcome it. Uh, I think that we have c had experience with concealed carry in other states, and it doesn't seem to lead to a, a big outbreak in mass shootings. Those are, those are different. So I would um, say that no, there is a constitutional right for that. Mr. Plummer. There's absolutely a constitutional right for concealed carry. I think it's ridiculous. The state of Illinois is the only one out of 50 states that doesn't offer its citizens the right to exercise their concealed carry rights. <laughs> and um, in, in terms of it being a federal issue, look, there's something called the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment reiterates the fact that something's in the Constitution, it's a federal issue, other things are forced to the state. As my opponent said, the right to bear arms is in the Constitution, therefore it's a federal issue. Therefore, when I go to Congress, I'm going to fight tooth and nail to make sure we provide all Americans a right to exercise all their constitutional rights, especially the Second Amendment. Time now, time now for closing statements. The candidates will each make a two-minute closing statement. The order of that was determined by the drawing before the event. Paula Bradshaw will make the first closing statement. Paula. Many Americans refuse to vote, saying it makes no difference since both parties are the same. Others insist that we have to vote so we can complain. We have the right to complain. This election, you have a chance to vote for a real choice, one you won't have to complain about. Americans give Congress low marks because it is corporate occupied and seems intent on selling the country to the highest bidder. Voters in District 12 have an opportunity this year to send a message by sending a green to Congress. I know that I'm not as polished or rehearsed as my opponents. I'm not backed by big money. I'm not backed by a political machine. I'm just a concerned citizen who is outraged because I'm paying attention. I know that not everyone spends most of their time reading about political policies or the economy, but shouldn't you choose someone who does to represent you? Shouldn't you choose someone who can learn from the past and prefers policies proven to work over policies proven to fail? Who knows that fraud, perjury, inside trading, and thrift theft are crimes, even if those in power deny it and refuse to prosecute the pr criminals? Who knows that torture, assassination, and unprovoked invasion are also crimes? Who thinks it's more important to hold public officials accountable than second graders? I hope you choose someone who faces reality and has a plan to deal with it instead of ignore it. Someone who wants to roll back the assaults on our liberty. I want all the Bill of Rights, not just the Second Amendment. Who opposes endless war. Who wants to protect our country for future generations and to make life better for the current generation. Who believes that government should be a force for good, not something to fear. Who believes the government is us, we the people, not it. That someone is me. I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Jason Plummer, uh, your closing statement. These are serious times. Uh, there's clearly serious policy differences up here on this stage being talked about. The voters have to make a choice. Do they want bigger government or do they want more freedoms? Do they want a robust economy where teachers and doctors and police officers and coal miners and small businessmen can all work together to provide for their families and provide opportunity? Or do you want the federal government strangling Southern Illinois? The fact of the matter is, folks, Southern Illinois is being strangled. Washington, D.C. is taking it to Southern Illinois. I'm in this race because I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed what's happening. I know the voters are frustrated. I want to take common sense, and I want to take Southern Illinois ideas to Washington, D.C. If you look at what's happening out there, the, 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 the people are frustrated, not just because the economy is bad. They're frustrated because the people in Washington aren't addressing the issues that they want to see addressed. There's gridlock. There's partisanship. You're not gonna see partisanship come out of me. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Earlier on the stage, I heard someone say, George W. Bush started two wars. I thought terrorists that slammed airplanes into buildings started wars. I couldn't believe that. Folks, folks, I'm not gonna put Republican labels or Democrat labels in front of what's a good idea. I'm gonna put Southern Illinoisans in front of what's a good idea. We need to go to Washington. We need true tax reform, I agree. We need to make sure corporations and folks are paying their fair share. We need to make sure that we eliminate loopholes and deductions. The U.S. Constitution is less than 10 pages. The tax code is more than 72,000 pages because it's being corrupted and we need to streamline it. Look what happened here in Illinois. Governor Quinn, who my opponent donated to and supported and advised, 
He gave a bailout to Sears. What did Sears just do? They just shut down the Kmart in Fairview Heights and cost more people in Southern Illinois jobs. We're bearing the brunt of these bad policies. We need leaders. We need people that are going to be honest. You're not going to create jobs in Southern Illinois. You're not going to fix the problems that the people of Southern Illinois encounter on a day-to-day -day basis if you're not willing to admit a problem. There's a problem. I'm going to Washington to fix it. Bill and to close. Annette and I would like to thank the sponsors and our volunteers. We just learned that we have the largest volunteer outpouring of support in the nation. We are humbled by it. Thank you. Shadowy figures who operate Chinese casinos and are under federal investigation have spent more than $1.2 million attacking me. Our campaign is fueled by volunteers. Annette and I thank each of you who has volunteered, made a contribution, made a call for us. Mr. Plummer has attacked me for being anti-coal. Yesterday, I was endorsed by the United Mine Workers of America, the folks who go down into the mines to, earn their li to risk their lives, who earn their livelihoods getting dirty to power our economy. Yes, Mr. Plummer, I'll proudly take that endorsement. On our Facebook page, you'll see the 2011 Illinois Teacher of the Year, Anna Sprave of Alton, the very best teacher in Illinois, is an educator for Enyart. Both the Illinois Federation of Teachers and the Illinois Education Association, the men and women who every day do their best to educate our children, support me. Yes, Mr. Plummer, I'll proudly take those endorsements. He has attacked me as a trial lawyer driving business out of Illinois. Tomorrow I go to Shell Credit Union in Wood River to pick up a letter of support and campaign contribution from the Credit Unions of America. That's where working people of America go to save their money to get home and car loans, not the Wall Street banks that engineered our financial crisis and that Mr. Plummer takes contributions from. Yes, Mr. Plummer, I'll gratefully take that endorsement from small businesses. This morning, I was unanimously endorsed by the Time. Fraternal Order of Police. Thank you very much. Okay, we have come to the end of our third broadcast congressional debate of this, 20, 000, this 2012 general election. Let's thank the candidates, Paula Bradshaw. Jason Plummer. And Bill Inyard. We also want to thank our panelists tonight, Beth Hunsdorfer of the Belleville News Democrat, Gary Metro of the Southern Illinois Newspaper, and Jennifer Fuller of WSIU Radio. Thanks also to the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, and to the faculty and staff of Lindenwood University who have been wonderful hosts for this whole event. And thank you. What a wonderful audience. Thanks for joining us. Good night from Belleville.